I think back to when I was in operating jobs, I mean, any, you know, you're lucky if you can get the data. I used to call, you know, look in the rear view mirror, like, I don't care what already happened. I want to know what's, what's going to happen. Right. And just all this resource is almost cheating, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's juicy as, as you said. And also I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge the, I guess, right before you joined, but the market must've known you're joining the, uh, $250 million raise, uh, June of last year at a $7.25 billion valuation. So that certainly is uh, a, a great thing and I guess it's better than a, a sharp stick in the eye. So uh, fantastic there. So what about uh, maybe la last question on Gong uh, from a culture perspective with Gong, if you were to be in the elevator with a recruit, um, kind of what, what would you say to that recruit about why they should work at Gong? You know, at Gong, I think although we were are super committed to creating an amazing product and a, a very scalable platform that works well for our customers and raving fans, we're equally as focused as creating one of the most desired places to work. So we operate in a way where everyone's rallying around this mission that I mentioned and also putting our operating principles really at the core of everything we do. Number one operating principles, create raving fans. We also, we win as a team. We favor the long-term. We talk about uh, challenging conventional right. wisdom that you see that all the time with our marketing team in terms of, you know, our logo is, is purple and pink and we have a dog in our branding. And so all these different things really help to shape how our culture works. But as you put it all really in the center, it is creating a place where individuals can really thrive and grow and bring their authentic and diverse self to work and be able to really thrive that way. So I like to think about Gong as being a people centric organization where so many companies today, especially when the economy and macro is tough, are all talking about operational efficiency, operational effectiveness. Of course, that's really important. But it really all comes down to the people and the culture first. And that's why I created this whole thought leadership brand, which is called Culture Driven Sales. All, oftentimes people talk about sales driven culture, where it's driven by the sales and it's driven by the productivity and operational principles, where I think it's actually the inverse. It's culture driven sales. If you have a strong mission, strong culture, strong operating principles, strong people first approach, then you're going to be able to get the best people and help to provide an environment where it's a positive place to work, where you can get the most out of that, those people because they're empowered. And then that in turn will drive more sales. So I yeah. think it culture drives sales instead of the Absolutely. other. Way and uh, very much related to our title topic, culture driven sales. Uh, you're actually the founder of Culture Driven Sales. So maybe explain that because they go hand in hand. Yeah, well, Randy, an interesting thing. So I spent 12 years at Tableau, started as first salesperson, ran, a, a, my title was EVP of sales, but effectively chief revenue officer there for 12 years. And I was growing into roles that I had never, ever, you know, staying in the role, but I had never done that before. Everything I was doing was always bigger and different. So when I finished that chapter and I decided, and the reason I decided I wanted to do board work is my youngest was going into high school and I wanted to be able to be more present and engaged before I was an empty nester. So I made the decision to step away from operational work and, and do some board work. And I wanted to do board work, advising and teach a course. And I wasn't sure, hey, I know I want to teach something about sales, but I'm not sure what, what is the best thing to teach. And I know I want to do board work, but how can I add the most value for CEOs and for companies? So what I did in that first year is I sat down with the whole slew of hyper growth tech CEOs, some later stage and some non-tech, but uh, in the first year, around 85 CEOs. And over the course of about two years, I sat down with about 130 founders and CEOs asking them what was the biggest challenge that they had in their sales and go to market. And then that led to me, like me being on these boards, being advising, but it also helped me to create this course. And what I found was many companies were asking, well, what do I do when sales and marketing aren't aligned? What do I do with sales is trying to sell something that's not what product is building or how, you know, how do I go scale? What are the operational principles of what I, I need to do? 
And one of the things we were really clear on at Tableau was we had this really clear mission that everyone was super aligned on. And we had these operating principles that really fueled how we hired, how we interacted with our customers, how we performance managed, how we build the culture in-house. And what I realized in talking to these 130 CEOs is that wasn't top of mind for everyone. They were more thinking like, operationally? How do I set up a comp plan? How do I do my org structure? What tools should I use? How do I go international? And so what I realized is I started asking people, well, what is your mission? And I'd realized I'd asked five execs at a company, CEO, co-founder, CRO, CFO, CHRO, and yep. I'd asked, and everyone got a different answer. And so basically what I realized here is we need to go to the top. How do how can we be intentional about setting up what that mission is, setting up those operating principles and then figuring out how do we actually do all of the sales plays and sales motions out of that? So that's where it comes to culture driven sales. With that, I launched my thought leadership platform. I started teaching a class which I created at University of Washington at the Foster School of Business. And then that is a lot of how I was helping all these boards of how to start thinking about building a scalable, sustainable, high culture, high performing sales and go to market organization. Wow, oh, that's great. Hey, um, I uh, should have mentioned before. So for those watching along or listening, you can see us or hear us. We cannot see you, obviously, uh, but certainly uh, feel free to ask uh, any questions or make any comments. You can post them and we have Tucker behind the scenes able to pull those up. And uh, we're very honored to have uh, Kelly Breslin Wright, the uh, president and chief operating officer with us today from Gong. So uh, getting back to how do you hire for culture? That's a great question. And it's very top of mind right now, because the interesting thing is when when we're in this huge talent war, you know, we're very, very tight labor market and people are all trying to get those high performing people. And those those top people, what they want is they want to be able to work at a place where they are that they feel part of that purpose. It comes back to what we were talking about a few moments ago, Randy, about mission is really important to make sure the whole company yeah. understands the purpose in their why. This is a really important way that to determine who wants to work for you, who not. Are they passionate about that? Why do they care? So that's the first. The second is making sure that we're asking the right questions in the interview process that are teasing out not only experience and resume, but also how they align with the right behavioral traits that are core to your culture and your operating principle. And as we talk about building a high performance culture, it's not just managing who is currently on the team, but how are you gonna continue to add people and interview for people, making sure they align with your purpose and your why, and making sure that they are in the same vein of what all your operating principles and culture are. Yeah. So I guess the, the, the devil's in the detail though, of kind of not setting up the person, but asking kind of more experiential questions about the background because everybody's going to say, Oh yeah, I'm totally bought into that mission. And yeah, your culture, I love. Uh, so there's probably times where you've seen, you thought you hired correctly for culture, but then, you know, not that the person misled, but just kind of then there just wasn't a fit. And do the people kind of vote with their feet or do you have to kind of proactively manage that? Well, I think there's two things, Randy, that you're talking. One is how do you actually tease that out more in the interview process? And the right. second is if someone's not showing up that way, what what do you do uh, internally? I think the the first piece is be really, really thoughtful in your interview process to make sure everyone involved in interviewing ha understands how to interview for behavioral traits. And so there's some key questions that I like to ask. I mean, everyone has the questions that they ask, but most people spend too much time, especially as they scale on the experience and resume. But some of the things are um, like questions that I like to ask. If I was a fly on the wall in last year's annual performance review, what would I hear were your strengths and what's your superpower and then what are your what are your development and growth areas? And you can understand even just from a question like that, are people self-aware of their development areas? 
Um, are they candid in how they communicate? Yeah. Are they like you learn so much from that question? Another question I like to ask is just I, mean, I can even try it with you, Randy. Like who in the world, Randy, knows you the best? It, it might be a friend, a spouse, a partner, a kid, someone you work with. Who knows you best? Uh, my wife, Janet. Okay. Well, Randy, how how would your wife describe you? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We're turning the table. I don't know why we don't want to go there now. But uh, Randy's like, wait, wait, how did I get on the hot seat? But you know what? That is a fantastic question yeah. to ask because you you strip away all the professional things and be able to find out at the core, who is this person? What is their real authentic self? And how do they describe it? And those are the kind of questions that you really want to ask to be. And, and then the other question is, you know, why do you want to work here? Why, why are you interested in this company and this time and what we do in this role? And sometimes people are like, oh, I want to join a rocket ship that's growing really fast. It's not a good reason to join because we know people that are most successful they align tightly with the purpose and they actually have passion and they get a fire in their belly by having an impact on whatever your why is. And so they need to understand why they care about that. Why? And so those are some things just to, to help the audience of questions that you could ask that align on the first question. And if you want, we can go to the second question of what if later on you realize someone is not the right fit, what do you do? But that's a different, that's a different approach. Yeah, I mean, f philosophically, the I know the you know performance reviews are the kind of the how with it you know gets kind of put in stone. But you know, I, I was always a fan of you know the feedback should be always should be real time. And if I as a leak call with somebody ask the manager, okay, what are the yeah, what are the strengths? But what are the things a person needs to work on? And then you know, manager would always rattle things off. And then when I was windshield time in the car, also you know, what are the things that um, you know you're discussing with Kelly that uh, you should be working on or improving? And you know, more times than not, uh, you know, it might be one thing or it's nothing. And to me, that's the fault of the manager. You know, the individual should always be asking and doing that. But you have to promote a culture where there is that open discussion. The manager is having that daily, weekly discussion with the individual, but then the individual is also cultivating it saying, hey, I just heard Randy or I just heard Kelly say, hey, we should be getting feedback. You haven't given me any feedback. Give me feedback. Yeah. You know, you, you just talked about a lot there. We, we have a <laughs> process here at Gong called Grow at Gong. And oftentimes what happens is these career conversations and are someone the right fit. And for those real great talent who are going to stay and grow and develop, it's a two-way conversation. So, so many times it is a manager talking and giving feedback to their direct report, but it's one, it's the accountability and ownership of the individual employee, regardless of level. But we also have to make sure as leaders that we're having a two-way conversation. So we know what it is that motivates our people, what gets them excited, where do they want to go next in their career? Because a lot of our job as leaders and managers is to help to help those people on our team accomplish what it is that they want to do. And so we need to really understand what it is that they want, what are their goals, what are their career aspirations, and how can we help to set them up? So that's on the career side. On the culture side, though, when we talk about performance management, if someone is like not doing something exactly right in their role, they're a salesperson and they're selling a lot, but they're not quite hitting quota because of some of the inputs that they're doing. That's something maybe we can manage to, you know, hopefully we can manage to. But if someone is not operating in accordance with your operating principle, they're showing up with too much ego. They're not winning as a team. They're not a good communicator. They're being rude. Um, people feel uncomfortable working with them. Like those are things we need to really tightly manage with performance because that can be a cancer in an organization if people are not operating according to your values and your culture. And I think we need to be much more firm of not allowing those. Like there's just no excuse yep. for showing up in a way where it's not creating a good place to work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for sure. And a lot of times I'm sure you found 
people, you know, you have to give them benefit of the doubt. You have to coach and improve as opposed to, hey, you're not doing it. You're gone. But more times than not, people say, well, I've never been told that. I've never received the feedback before. So a lot of times people appreciate that. And I always find longer discussion, but kind of the, the top performers, the ones where you can really, yeah, th I think at the most leverage, you want to help and coach everybody. But if you can coach up those top performers a little bit more, the company's going to get a lot more out of it. You're going to have great retention from those people because they're saying, wow, I'm actually nobody wanted to coach me before because I was always a top performer, but I'm a top performer and I'm getting coached. And by the way, I'm going to have other top performers come here.